Hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, COVID-19 Update for Schools. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Sarah Porter, and I'm the Director of Healthy Green Schools and Colleges, a partnership between Healthy Schools Campaign and Green Seal. Formerly called Green Clean Schools, this program leverages more than a decade of Healthy Schools Campaign's work, along with Green Seal's additional expertise, providing even more resources for creating healthy, sustainable, and effective cleaning and facility management programs. Before we begin, I'm going to quickly review some basics for today's webinar. The webinar will run for approximately one hour and a recording of the webinar will be available to view later. We will email you a link to the recording and it will also be archived on the Healthy Green Schools and Colleges website. We're going to save the bulk of our time today for a question and answer session with our steering committee members. You can ask questions by typing a question into the questions box located on your control panel and clicking on the send button. Feel free to send questions through the questions box at any time during the presentations, and we will answer them during the Q&A session at the end. As you all know, COVID-19 has completely changed the way schools and colleges are cleaned and maintained, and it looks like many of the challenges the pandemic have ca has caused are here to stay. As your custodial team reflects on lessons learned from August and September reopenings and prepares for the winter flu season ahead, we know that you have many questions and are looking for tools and resources to help you help guide you during this critical time. Today's webinar, the third and final in our series of fall COVID-19 update webinars, is to designed to help you with just that. We have a panel of three committee members from higher education and K-12 institutions who are going to share an update on what they've learned since the beginning of the school year including adjustments they've made, new challenges, and creative solutions. Today's speakers all participated in one of the earlier webinars in the series and are back today to focus in more detail on some of the topics that emerged from questions posed by attendees of those earlier webinars. Today, we're gonna to take a deeper dive into their experiences um, and um, shared lessons on cr and creative solutions for staffing challenges, budget implications, and disinfection. Before we move on, please note that the information shared during this webinar is for general informational purposes only. The experiences and information shared today are not intended to replace, directly supplement, or formally operationalize the guidance provided by the US federal government, including recommendations published by the Centers for Disease Control, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and the US Environmental Protection Agency. We encourage you to visit those federal agency web pages if you're seeking formal instruction on how to develop or update your cleaning protocols in response to COVID-19 or any public health emergency. We will include links to these resources in our follow-up email. Today's webinar is a knowledge sharing event in which the leaders of green cleaning and building operations in colleges, universities, and K-12 districts will share their experiences. On the webinar today, we have Mervyn Brewer, the Assistant Custodial Supervisor of Salt Lake City School District in Salt Lake City, Utah. Chris Raines, the Director of Administrative Services at Consumers River Community College in Sacramento, California. And Jean Woodard, the Director of the Building Services Department at the University of Washington in Seattle, Washington. First, I'd like to introduce Merv Brewer from Salt Lake City School District in Salt Lake City. Merv? Well, uh, hey, I look a whole lot better in this picture, I just gotta tell you. Um, you. You guys really know how to make me look handsome, that's great. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that, Marv, we'll switch to the right slide. No, that's okay, I want people to, to think I look this good. But hey, so I'm Merv Brewer and I am known as the assistant, uh, currently the assistant uh, custodial manager in Salt Lake City School District. We are usually about 26,000 uh, students strong and we have like 40 facilities to take care of between junior highs, high schools, elementaries, uh, administration type buildings, transportation buildings, and warehouse, that sort of thing. So some of the things that I really wanted to touch base on here uh, as far as our challenges right now. The biggest thing that we are, are facing is staffing. And let me tell you where we're at as far as having uh, school back in session. Um, 
for those of you who hadn't heard, so in Salt Lake City School District, we are online learning. We're the only one here in the state of Utah right now with the full online learning going on. We do not have any in-person classes except a few of the special ed type classes, uh, the special needs type classes. There are some of those that are being held, but for the most part, um, we are doing online learning. What that means is our schools are open, the teachers are back and doing the online uh, learning portions from their classrooms. We are serving school lunch from the uh, from the the kitchens. Are preparing school lunch and putting them in bags uh, for drive-through out in the parking lot during lunchtime. So we're still doing lunches that way uh, for the community. And then we have some sites that are doing like the food bank type of box uh, thing for uh, for the community as well during this time. So we're still being used quite a bit. And of course, in the high schools, sports, 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 um, nothing slows down for sports. <laughs> um, so we still have plenty of sports going on. With all of those things, believe it or not, we still have staffing is our biggest issue. And when I say that, we are getting anywhere between 1,000 and 2,000 cases of COVID in the state of Utah per day reported, meaning uh, with a 14 to 15% uh, positivity rate, uh, we are hit very hard. We are a real hot spot right now. So with staffing, we have a few um, head custodians who are out or they have family members who uh, pop positive. So of course they are, are quarantined as well. We have lost a couple of um, evening crews where you'll have a part-timer, usually a student worker, that will come in and start doing their work, take their mask off, go to break with all the other student workers, and one of them pops positive for COVID, so now all of them have to be quarantined for a couple of weeks, and that really is not uh, really is not good. So, for us, staffing is an issue. We have to move, uh, be creative, with um, asking people to maybe change some shifts here and there. We are very fortunate in that we have overtime approved for this year only. Uh, for any time that we actually need to uh, pay some overtime, and we have we have been uh, we have been doing that. So, oh, now oh, I was going to say I even look better. Now I'm Jean. <laughs> okay, so one other thing I wanted to touch on uh, besides the staffing and the fact that uh, we have to go to an overtime scenario to to make up. Uh, what we're doing in our staffing. We have found that we are able to, to maintain our protocol. We are able to maintain the protocol that we have in place, which is a very high level of uh, disinfecting and sanitizing throughout the day and into the evening. We are able to do exactly what we need to do without, uh, without any problem. We would be doing the exact same protocol if we had students in the building, by the way. So we're doing it exactly the same as if school was in session because again, we have people in the building. The one thing that we have changed in our cleaning uh, protocol, uh, because we are fortunate enough with, uh, with the COVID outbreak that the administrators in our district saw the value of what we do. They saw the value of the chemicals that we, we have and the um, machinery that we have. We can on-site generate um, sanitizer till the cows come home as long as we have water, salt, and electricity. So we don't have to worry about supply chain issues, which is a huge, huge benefit. Uh, one of the things that we have been able to do more of because we're getting more on-site generators, in fact we're purchasing five more as I speak, we are um, sending out the purchase order for five more on-site generators. These will go into our junior high schools. Our high schools already have them. We have about half of our schools that use what's called Aquies Ozone in a caddy that's on-site generated. They use that for restrooms. They use it for spot cleaning carpets. Um, imagine having a biological uh, event on a carpet or even on your, uh, your soft plush uh, furniture and being able to use a product that will, uh, if it'll sanitize somewhere else, it's going to sanitize inside of that, that fabric, okay? 
Uh, I mean, common sense will tell you that. Like a hydrogen peroxide product would, or uh, in this case, uh, aqueous ozone. So this stuff is absolutely amazing at being able to spot clean those carpets and give them a level of sanitization that you've never been able to do before. Because let's face it, what, what do most people do to clean their carpets? Once in a great while, they'll throw a bonnet on it and spray down the, the carpet and then smoosh the dirt around. Um, or if you have an extractor, that's great. Extractors leave them nice and, and wet. These uh, these machines actually remove most of that water, so they dry rather quickly. So those are the things that have kind of changed in our um, in our realm. As far as the protocol itself, our protocol has stayed the same, but our ability to use the uh, the chemicals and equipment has been enhanced due to the fact that there are some people who really um, have have seen the benefits in what we do and how we do it. Thank you, Merv. And just have to apologize to everyone for the technical difficulties we're having behind the scenes. I hope you got a good chuckle out of it. Um, technology God is just not with us today, um, but we're getting there and we've got your beautiful face, um, your handsome face up there, Merv. So thank you for sharing all of that. Um, you have so much going on there and um, really taking some time to focus on some of that stuff in particular is is very helpful. So thank you for everything that you've shared. Um, I am now going to introduce our next speaker who you've been gazing at all of this time. Um, <clears throat> Chris Rains, the Director of Administrative Services at Consumers River Community College in Sacramento, California. Chris, welcome back. Yes, yes, the, the smile is actually true for right now. I'm having my, my face and Merv's voice uh, gave me a good laugh on this Friday Eve. Um, my name is Chris Frains. I'm the Director of Administrative Services at Consumers River College, which is part of the Los Rios Community College District, uh, second largest in the state, fifth largest in the nation. Um, I have been in this position for two years. Um, the changes and, and things that have, have hit the, my radar the most over this, this experience that we've all gone through is um, Los Rios shut their campuses down um, last um, March and have been shut down through the summer and through the fall and we will still remain shut down through the spring with the exception of first responder lab classes, i.e. nursing, um, steganography and EMTs as an example of that. So we went from a million square feet to roughly about 1,500 square feet being used um, through four days a week, periodically, you know, a couple hours here, a couple hours there during the day. Um, so it sidelined a lot of my custodial staff for, for a good long period from March and through the summer that there was, there was no classes. Um, the, the, EMT classes and first responders just started this fall. So they they sat in the dry dock for an extended period of time, um, was very um, very hard on them because they wanted to contribute and be part of what the take care of things. And they wanted to get in and do project work and all that other stuff that came up that they just weren't allowed to come on campus to do. So again, it goes falling into that, that the, the challenge of finding finding people who want to work, something meaningful to do, so they do feel part of the team, and they're contributing, because, you know, everyone starts worrying about, you're going to, you know, I'm going to get laid off if I'm not doing anything, they can't keep me paying me for sitting at home forever, and all that other stuff that came with that, so that, that was been one of the challenges on, on, and I'll speak more on that as, as I move on with, with the custodial crew, and then as, as we did phase back in these classes, getting them updated on, on any SOP changes that have, that have come into play, which similar to MERV, a lot of the stuff that we, we were doing, we were already doing. Um, really our, our re-entry plan, we put COVID in front of a lot of the cleaning uh, guidelines we already had in place because we were already doing what um, was expected of us anyway, because we were already cleaning and getting rid of germs and unwanted items on surfaces to start with before COVID. But updating them on, on any increase in frequencies that we're wanting, expectations on, on reporting issues or seeing things, those things needed to be brought in. And then the other big thing at the, at the start was also reminding them that, you know, you've been sitting for an extended period of time. Make sure you give yourself a good stretch, flex some muscles, don't overdo it, um, watch what you're doing and how you're doing it. Um, 
and all that. And then the other side fun one to deal with was reminding them is, yes, I have no work for you to do, but you're still on call to where if I need you to come in because something's gone wrong with a busted pipe or whatever, you still need to be within within reach to come into work Monday through Friday. So you can't go camping um, up into the mountains um, because you you're don't have any work to do today. You you can do that, but you got to use vacation. Um, so constantly reminding them of that and making sure that they were um, readily available when when they were needed, if they were needed. Um, the other big thing was the the always comes up with from the custodial department and my maintenance guys uh, is, is budget. You know what's happening with the budget? What's what, what's going on? And I, I operate under the uh, simple paradigm of of no surprises. Um, if I have information on the budget, I share it. I make sure they're they're aware of when there is any budget updates that they can attend in person via Zoom. Um, to here it is, go here, listen to what the vice president is saying. Um, so they're they're fully aware, and and when you can tell them that the state of California budget that it passed this past summer had specific language in it that school districts, the K through 18, could not make budget shortfalls up on laying off food service, transportation, or custodial workers. You're just letting the guys you're safe for this budget cycle. You 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 everything's good. You're not going to get any any laid off or anything along those lines. Um, and then the other thing was with, with the budget is is getting very familiar or finding someone who's very familiar with the CARES Act. Um, there are mechanisms in that to assist in purchasing of items, um, be it PPE or even potentially equipment to assist in, in the needs on that one. So there, there are avenues out there that just aren't the traditional budget uh, guidelines that you operate on a normal basis. There may be things out there you could qualify for via the CARES Act. So I would encourage people to find your school district's expert on that and, and ask some questions to them. And lastly, the biggest thing that I, I've been kicking on the last couple of weeks is is, is supporting the staff. And, and if, if you haven't seen, seen them for a while, they haven't talked to you a while, reach out, call your staff, see how they're doing, set up a go-to meeting or a Zoom, put everybody in the room together just to see each other's faces, let them chat with you ask the questions that they may not ask um, any other time, just, and do an information dump as best you can. You can make it, make it playful at one end and the other hand, and then weave in some updates on, you know, what we're doing, how we're doing that, any other additional classes gonna come on in the spring, any construction projects that are happening. Just, again, it gives them that, that uh, person contact that they're not getting while they're trying to navigate doing geometry at home with their, with their ninth grader. So those are the, the challenges and the things that I've been um, dealing with since last March. I turn it over to Sarah. Thanks, Chris. And uh, thanks again for being a, a good sport, Chris and Mer, for our, our slide snafu there. Um, I really appreciate Chris how you, and you talked about this in our in our webinar earlier this week about the constant and consistent communication to your team um and being super transparent about what's going on as much as you can that seems like an incredible and incredibly important uh tool and, and way to make them feel supported even when the message you're delivering maybe is one that it you know can be frustrating like you can't go camping in the woods because we need you on call and even though i might not have work for you to do kind of thing so i appreciate you sharing all that um, we are going to switch over to our um, final speaker for today, um, and uh, I'm going to introduce Jean Woodard, the Director of the Building Services Department at the University of Washington in Seattle. And lo and behold, Jean, we see your smiling face, so welcome. Thank you, Sarah. I was hoping you'd leave. Chris has had some face up there. but. Uh... <laughs> I guess I'll gaze at myself there. Um, yeah, the University of Washington is the flagship uh, university for the state of Washington, approximately 44,000 students. Um, about 10,000 students normally live on campus. Uh, on any given day, we would have approximately 70,000 people on campus. Um, research University, there are 300 specialized research centers on campus. And even though, um, well, the Seattle area and the state of Washington 
uh, was um, early on uh, the COVID cases. Uh, we had an outbreak in February, uh, which resulted in us um, going to online learning uh, in March, a couple of weeks before uh, the spring break. Um, we developed, oh, I should say we have uh, 13 million square feet, about 185 buildings that we service in the academic research and administrative spaces on campus. Uh, we had a staff of a little over 300 people. Uh, and uh, we serviced uh, primarily during the daytime. So we kind of a unique operations. Our primary cleaning is done from 5 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. Early on, um, when the pandemic started, we developed three objectives. And the first was to help flatten the curve uh, the second was to ensure the safety of our employees. And the third was to provide meaningful and productive work for our uh, employees. So the, uh, the way we helped flatten the curve was we put people on a part-time schedule for being on site. The, they would work two days on site. Uh, three days at home and they would be paid. And the next week they would work three days on site, two days um, at home. So we would have about half of our the crew that we normally would have. So we immediately knew that we uh, disinfecting and enhanced cleaning of high touch points was important. So we um, started focusing on the research spaces and where the few spaces where people were coming in the campus. Uh, we anticipated that there might be in-person instruction for the start of the spring. And so our first plan that we developed was to disinfect all the lecture halls, auditoriums, classrooms, the libraries, places where students congregate. And as we started doing more disinfecting and staff are using we're disinfecting most of the day and we were using a quat, uh, we decided to phase out that quaternary ammonia product and convert to a hydrogen peroxide product, which is less of a respiratory irritant uh, when you're using it for long, prolonged periods of time. We also uh, wanted to be uh, more efficient in how we were disinfecting these spaces. So we acquired sprayers, as well as electrostatic sprayers to our to our arsenal. So we stepped up our, our procedures in terms of uh, enhanced disinfecting and really pointed out uh, to our staff the human touch points that needed to be clean. Um, when spring quarter was canceled or went mostly to uh, remote learning, we then um, uh, started plan two, which was to disinfect and deep clean all the or all the staff spaces, offices, break rooms, lounges, conference rooms. And we did that through June. And we continued with that rotating schedule, uh, which wasn't really going to be sustainable. So in June, we brought everybody back to campus as essential employees. Um, and But at the same time, we offered voluntary furloughs to those who uh, had concerns about being on campus, have underlying conditions, or who were over 65. And so approximately 55 people uh, uh, accepted an offer to voluntarily furlough. Uh, they were eligible. They, we continued to pay their medical benefits, dental benefits, and they were eligible for unemployment. And to this day, we now we've extended those voluntary furloughs and uh, we have approximately 35 to 40 people that are still on a voluntary uh, furlough. And we, done, we did all we could to um, increase the, the benefits. Uh, there was concerns with a lot of our employees who have children, school-age children, that they now had daycare issues. So we uh, really provided additional daycare resources. Uh, we were pretty generous with offering leave to our staff for a variety of situations related to uh, COVID and how it impacted their families. We actually created a emergency uh, fund for employees 
uh, where uh, the university contributed to this fund and several of my employees have been given financial grants based on uh, financial hardship that they experienced during this time. So we really try to look out for our, our staff during this time of high anxiety and it, and it continues to be as we're uncertain of what the future is gonna hold. We were fully expecting there to be 10% uh, in-person classes, about 55 of our buildings reopening uh, for the autumn quarter, which started on September 28th. Uh, we actually stood up a different shift, a 7.30 to 4 p.m. shift, so that we would have staff available to uh, disinfect uh, classes, in between classes. We worked with uh, academic services to have one hour breaks for class, classes and all the spaces were uh, uh, provided with uh, physical uh, distancing and seats marked for where you can sit and directional arrows and in one door, out another door, um, requiring mask wearing. But as it turned out, there's probably only 2% of classes actually taking place on campus. Those are um, primarily the upper level science courses, dance, art, uh, and a few labs that, um, you know, you don't want students uh, experimenting with chemicals at home. So those are the types of classes that need to take place on site. And we've been continuing to provide ongoing um, enhanced disinfecting to those spaces. Uh, at the same time, uh, we developed plan three, which, to, which was to do floor work and deep cleaning and just shine every square inch of campus that we could. And we completed that up through September. Uh, we're now going to uh, looking at uh, expanding our carpet cleaning, uh, floor work and offices and places that we don't normally um, get access to uh, or have the uh, means to do floor work. So we're taking this opportunity to provide meaningful work and the, the campus is going to be cleaner than it ever ever has been. Uh, the university has already accept, uh, taken, I shouldn't say accepted, but uh, we took a 4.6% reduction in our state funds. Uh, building services, uh, the custodial part of my department is fully state funded, um, but we've had a hiring freeze and we have not filled positions during this time and we we're able to absorb that budget cut through the hiring freeze. Um, and at the same time with furloughs, we're also building up reserves. So we're able to buy equipment to help us, um, you know, it's primarily carpet cleaning equipment, upholstery cleaning equipment, so that we can assign more people to do th that, that particular work. Um, we're anticipating a shortfall for the next fiscal year and possibly another 5% cut. And um, so we're going to be really cautious about the number of positions that we fill as people retire or move on to other other positions. So we we think we have a solid plan in terms of completing the the projects and and getting the campus clean. But at some point, we'll have all of that completed. And so that's I, I'm hoping that the timing of that aligns with um, students being back on campus more research being uh, taking place on campus, uh, more people working on site so that we can uh, provide that um, daily disinfecting, which now we have the capacity to do. Um, and so it'll be a, um, something for us to monitor as we move forward as the population increase, increases. Um, I'm optimistic for next fall. Um, and I think that's about all that I have right now. And so I will turn it back to Sarah. Thank you, Jean. You shared so much, and I appreciate you, especially being you know pretty detailed on the budget implications of this for your program and where you're able to save and absorb some cuts. And um, I think you, what you've shared about really being focused on making sure there's meaningful work for your team to do, to do and some of your creative ways of making sure that that happens is um, is really inspiring. So thank you for, for sharing all of that. We are going to move into the Q&A portion of our webinar. So for those of you listening, please go ahead um, 
And if you haven't already, share your questions um, in the question box and then we will get to as many of them as we can um, uh, in, uh, in the time we have allotted today. So um, <clears throat> uh, I am going to start Jean, um, with a question for you, because I think this you're the, um, you might be the only person this applies to. Um, but can you talk a little bit about? I know that you um, we talked in the the webinar earlier this week about sort of the the isolation housing that you have. Can you talk more specifically about your protocol for cleaning and disinfecting um, those spaces? Um. I wish I could speak directly to the uh, experience of cleaning the resident halls. Um, that is a separate custodial operation, but we have been, uh, their operation, and the, and the university also has two other campuses. We've all been in sync with our procedures and the, the uh, using the CDC guidelines for the products that we use. Um, and I know that they have a solid operation. Uh, there are about a couple of thousand students staying on campus and there are 900 uh, rooms set aside for isolation and quarantine. And the number of students living on campus who've had to be quarantined has been very small percentage. So the education and the cases of students on campus has uh, been minimal. Um, we were concerned with what happens if there's an emergency and our utility workers or the plumbers have to go in to a, a place where a student is positive. And the protocols are is to, if it's an emergency, to send the crew in, uh, proper PPE, disinfect and deep clean the space, then address the emergency. Um, but if it's not an emergency, they would move that student to another facility and wait as long as they can if they had some repairs to do. Um, there was a serious outbreak with the sororities and fraternities around campus. Uh, there's 45 houses, 19 houses have uh, cases, there's over 300 cases. And so the university just recently offered these quarantine rooms to uh, the frat houses and the sorority houses as well. So. Um, I can't speak to the experience of, of cleaning those, but I, I have just a, a, a higher level understanding of what they, they do. They, um, they have electrostatic sprayers as well. So I hope that addressed address the question. Yeah, thanks, Jean. Um, Merv, I'm gonna switch over to you and ask a, a similar but, but different question. Can you talk about your protocol um, whether you've had this experience or what your plan is when you have a confirmed space, uh, when you have a confirmed case um, in, in one of your schools, what's, what's the protocol both like uh, logistically in terms of the process of addressing that space, but also your communication plan? Okay, um, let me address that the best way I can because we did have, we did have something like this um, just recently in one of our buildings where an administrator uh, had tested positive. And what our protocol, our, our regular protocol is of course a lot of cleaning, a lot of sanitizing. But in this case, where you have a confirmed, oh, this person definitely had it, automatically what, what happens and this usually comes down through administrative levels because most of the COVID uh, cases are handled through our HR department. So uh, each individual department, for example, has a contact that they contact, hey, I'm not feeling well, or I've got the sniffles, or hey, my wife got tested, whatever. And then they are sent to the HR people. And the HR people will contact us and say, hey, so-and-so has tested positive for COVID. Now, that's one way that the communication works. The other way is the good old pipeline that most custodians have. Custodians know what goes on in their buildings and quite often they know before HR knows what's going on in the building. So once something is confirmed, then immediately our, uh, our staff, uh, of course, that, that area is, is uh, quote, quarantined, 
meaning that uh, the the folks that are currently in that area, of course, will have to leave, go to you know wherever else. Um, we do give some time for the air to settle. And I know that there's been this, you know, whole 24 hour blah, 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 and it's in the air and, and whatnot. Uh, but with, with the equipment that we use, we aren't too worried about that. And let me tell you why here in just a second. So um, we will usually, after everyone has left the area, go in and it's, it's interesting to watch. It's like the little scrubbing bubbles. And I know this because I had to do an investigation as to whether or not it was actually happening. So I watched on our security cameras, I watched my crews go in to this building and like little scrubbing bubbles, just go through and move and wipe and move and wipe everything, everything down in this whole office area. And then when they were finished, they grabbed this machine that we have. It looks like a, uh, it looks like a big cardboard box with about uh, three smokestacks on it silver smokestacks it looks really funny and they wheel that in they turn it on they plug it in and turn it on and it uh basically fills that space in the matter of just a couple of minutes with a hyperchlorous product an on-site generated hyperchlorous product that uh, has kill claims to knock this thing well not kill claims i you're, you're inactivating the virus is what you're doing uh, but yes it takes care of it very quickly so we aren't as worried about what's in the air because we are fogging the air as well so it's in the air it's boop it's it's gone it's dead done and whatever other areas in that in that particular room so that is our protocol and it's i hate to say it but it's easy squeezy lemon peasy it is quick it is fast i watched our people go in and do an office area start to finish in less than 30 minutes with 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 two people and a third person assisting grabbing different things from here and there thanks merv i i like your scrubbing bubbles uh imagery there um chris is there anything you would want to share about your what your plans and protocols are in place um at some point in the future if you have the same situation very very similar to, to merv we we've had um cases of where people have been exposed but no confirmed cases so even when the the exposure happens the class gets shut down for for 14 days um so if there's not an immediate use for the for the room because the, the emts can only work in that one room we just we just lock the room for four or five days and then we go in there and we do our scrubble scrubbing bubble routine too and and run through and wipe everything down there's there's a checklist um to, to follow on what needs to be cleaned and, and with what um, all that all the steps that are in there that we can have written confirmation that it's been done from the custodial staff um, as needed. I think the, the more interesting thing the district has struggled with doing is doing the, 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 the tracing without it without trying to out the person who potentially have has COVID due to HIPAA and, and all those guidelines that are there. Um, there's not a lot of muscle memory um, with, with the district at the start of this on, on how to do that. Some people were being notified of, of cases that didn't need to be notified um, and all that. So it's, it's again, it's, it's interesting how some protocols that are in place, I felt that the, the cleaning protocols were the, the, the least worrisome that we, the district had to worry about. It was notification and tracing was what sort of came up as the the weak point no one's at fault for that it's not something we've really ever had to do before us but it still causes some muscle spasms every time we get a confirmed exposure um, due to the nature of the classes that are currently lab classes that are happening on the campus thanks for sharing chris yeah it's definitely um a new and different situation that we've we've all been learning how to handle so i, I appreciate you sharing that um, Jean, I'm going to switch back over to you. You talked a little bit about um, how you um, sort of earlier on at the beginning of this made a change to the disinfectant that you were using. And I'm wondering if you could talk about the uh, why you made that switch and then how you went about selecting a different product and then specifically 
how how did you communicate that to your team and how did they receive that um do i'm i'm wondering about sort of sometimes you know folks can be resistant to change they might have embraced something different um just wondering if you could talk a little bit about why why and how that you made that change and then how that went over with your team um yes when we increased the amount of time that the custodians were disinfecting spaces and we were deep cleaning and disinfecting class entire classrooms um we, we told people to take frequent breaks, but we started hearing concerns about respiratory issues. And um, because in the past, we've always had, we've had an employee engagement program for the last seven years. So we involve our frontline staff in all of our evaluations of potential products to use. So I forget the exact number that, um, we brought in to sample and to see how it worked. Then, you know, they were all on the CDC list, effective against uh, Corona of uh, the coronavirus. And I also had the benefit of other steering committee members' experience. Um, and I knew that many of them had already moved to a hydrogen peroxide, so that was a real solid recommendation uh, from uh, my fellow com uh, steering committee members. Um, so we had. Uh, crews uh, evaluate the products for a couple of weeks, submit a written evaluation form. Uh, was there any respiratory effects? How did this work? And we got their input and we reached a decision to select the, the hydrogen peroxide product. And they were, uh, their response has been very positive because they had input in the decision but they also say that the product has less of a smell, it's less of an irritant, um, and it has a shorter dwell time than uh, the quad. And so they're more effective, more productive. And, and so it's been a, a real positive change for us. It was an easy, easy transition, uh, very little resistance at all. And I wish I would have done that sooner. In fact, in hindsight, I wish we would have made that switch uh, before this pandemic hit. Thanks, Jean. That actually um, leads me to the next question. Um, and I'll, I'm gonna ask each of you to answer this, but if you wanna start off, Jean, I, the question is, um, what will fundamentally be different about how you run your program post COVID? Um, you know, what lessons have you learned that will will be lasting changes even when we're 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 when this pandemic is is in the rear rear view mirror um that's an excellent question i think the requirement to wear a mask will be uh indefinite i think um how we conduct meetings and keep people physically distant um how we clock in and out um uh, we've expanded the number of clock-in stations so that we can keep people spaced out. They, it used to be a, a, a very crowded activity. And so I think those types of activities or, or just how we keep people safe will, will continue. We, um, if people are required to work within six feet of one another, uh, we do a, a hazard assessment to really see if there's other options to keep people apart. Um, and if there isn't, we provide them with uh, a surgical mask and we really limit the time that they spend working within six feet of one another. I think that will continue into the future. I think the uh, focus on enhanced disinfecting and frequent disinfecting will continue well into the future uh, as well. Um, I think those are the, the highlights. I think also I'm hoping that now that the public has, has focused on the importance and the value of cleaning and disinfecting, that it leads to um, the cleaning worker having a, a higher status in the organization and, and be really valued uh, higher, which may result in the long term in higher wages for the cleaning worker. Um, that's a hope that I have that will be a result of this. 
Thank you, Jean. I think that's, um, you know, if there is a, a silver lining here, uh, it would be great if, if that was it. So I appreciate you sharing all that. Um, Merv, I'll pose the same question to you. What will fundamentally be different about your program in a post-COVID world? Jean brings up some great points. Uh, I think of PPE is definitely going to be something going forward that our people take a lot more seriously. I think everybody will take PPE a lot more seriously. And the uh, use of masks going forward as we do di uh, different things uh, at work. Um, uh, social distancing, I don't see that as, as really uh, changing much in, in the post-pandemic world here for us. But what I do see is that because of the pandemic and the opportunities that it that it gave us, I do see that we will have a custodial world for us that has the equipment that we've been wanting and needing, that we could only get one piece instead of the 30 that we need. Uh, now we will have we will have what we need in the hands of our people to do a safe, effective, uh, thorough job of sanitizing uh, with with chemicals that that are very uh, less toxic than what we had been uh, using in the past in some areas. But now we'll be able to be more efficient because we've got the equipment, we've got more of the chemical. Uh, we will also have the protocols in place that we've wanted to put in place, but because of the culture that had been built in our district, oh, you got to have shiny floors, oh, you got to have every scrap of everything vacuumed off the floor every night, uh, people are now a lot more concerned about, oh, our, our doorknobs or our phones or, you know, the, the sanitization, the, the healthy part that we've been trying to push for so long has been so easy now to, uh, to, to push this agenda forward. I think going out of here, we are going to have a much more um, healthy facility than we have ever had before using environmentally safe uh, practices and products. Thank you, Merv. I really appreciate how you framed opportunities that this has brought. Um, it's not always to keep easy to, to be to be optimistic and, and see those opportunities. I love that you said it that way. Um, Chris, you're not off the hook. I'm going to kick the same no, question to uh, you. Merv, Merv just took some of my thunder because, again, it, the one thing that popped in my head right away is, is the old adage that I've been pushing for years, cleaning for health, not appearance. Um, I would rather have clean touch points and and all those things taken care of versus a shiny glossy floor any any day of the week um so i do think there is a the, the iron is hot on this topic and is begging to be hit but with a hammer once or twice to remold how the custodial departments clean and maintain their buildings and what the overall goal of that is it's the health not the appearance um, it's not saying that we're going to let it just build up and look nasty and dirty on the floors, but I would rather have a clean doorknob than a vacuum floor. Um, there's some wiggle room, and again, on a first grade or a second grade class, uh, class where the little people are on the floors type situations, but in my world and Gene's world where you're dealing with adults, we don't have that much setting on the floor. Um, the other thing that I think is the biggest change for, for me, and I've had private conversations with Gene on this, is the old way of the custodial department being on graveyard coming in once a day doing a thorough cleaning um, and resetting and for the next day um, i envision a very small group of people still working the the late shift and more people on days and swing to do those common touch points on a far more frequent basis that is currently being done because now more than ever it's it's the time to be seen cleaning um, not being the, the hidden house elves that everyone just comes back the next day, everything's nice and pretty and, and put back in their place. They, they need to see us doing the work we're doing and appreciate what we're doing and how we're doing it um, for the college community or the campus community. So again, um, if, if, you, if you're wanting to, to change things right now and how your, your end game plays and what you're getting the deliverables out of, right now is the time to push it. Um, being proactive in, in situations like this is far, far better than being reactive. Um, if you're wanting to, to rechange something and retool it, um, get a committee together, go for it, 
Um, I, I think you'll have a lot of interest and insight from, from people that um, have already done it and are also willing to do it. Um, so that is my answer to that. Thanks, Chris. Cleaning for Health, um, definitely the the key message there for sure. Um, gonna switch to a different question. Um, <clears throat> one of our participants today, Mary Denny, wants to know um, how are you communicating your processes to the campus community? And I think we've touched on it here and there, um, but um, Jean, I'll start with you. Can you talk specifically about communicating your, your processes to the larger uh, campus community? And, and also, have you needed to work with other depart departments in your university in a new and different way in order to do that? Um, thanks, Sarah. Yes, we've uh, focused on communications right away. Um, and I'm fortunate to have a, a communication person in my department who works with the UW facilities communication department as well as the universities. So we were aligned in a strategy and everyone wanted to know how the campus was being cleaned. So we updated our website with specific information regarding that. We uh, developed a video which involved our custodians describing and it actually showed them doing deep cleaning and describing what they were doing. I had a, a speaking part in that to give a higher level explanation. Uh, the start of the autumn quarter, uh, I produced another video describing to that was geared towards students to tell them how we were cleaning uh, learning spaces. Uh, we have what's called a building coordinators uh, group who are the liaisons for the departments and all the, the buildings on campus. And I've presented uh, three different webinars uh, participate in three different webinars describing what we're doing, what our plans are, and how they, the campus can help us. And this was in conjunction with our customer care team with environmental health and safety, UW police. Um, so it was a collaborative effort in, uh, to continuously get information out to the campus. That's one of the most important things to do. And we're continually, continuously updating our website as um, things evolve and are revised. Thanks, Jean. Um, Merv, could you talk a little bit about um, your sort of thread of communication there at Salt Lake? We were very fortunate, and I wanna say we were very unique in how this, in how this went down. Uh, I had mentioned at some, some previous webinars where in the very beginning, we were brought into a meeting with some high level people that wanted to know what the what was going on as far as our ability to keep uh, the supplies coming. And we had told them that because we use on-site generation, uh, we are able to continually make sanitizer as long as we want. And because of that, that, uh, that got their attention out, out of the gate, that we were doing the right things that we were on top of things and they started to talk to us about well what is what is your protocol because they knew these administrators knew that there would be teachers and teachers unions and and other administrators other departments that needed to know how this was all going to be taken care of they they needed that surety that that peace of mind so we quickly developed the protocols that we would be using during the uh, pandemic, pandemic, these new protocols. And that went out through the board meeting, that went out on the district website uh, as, as an announcement. It went out uh, as a general email to every employee that here is how this is going to be dealt with in the schools. So there was that. Then of course, there's our head custodians, our site managers who are there and can talk to in person, uh, whether it be the, the, the principal, the teachers, the cafeteria staff, whomever, about here's why we're doing what we're doing. Here's how we're going to do it and here's why we do it. So it's been a, a multi-pronged approach to getting the information out there. And we were very fortunate in that we had that support from the highest possible levels 
in letting the world know uh, here what the plan is as far as um, getting these facilities ready in a, uh, a sanitizing, sanitizing and, and getting them ready. That's awesome. Um, thanks for sharing that, Merv. Before we switch to our last question, um, <clears throat> for those of you um, listening to our webinar today, just want to take a moment and um, ask you to share with us through the questions box if there are particular topics that you would be interested in having us focus on in future programming, um, either later this year or next year that we have not covered in this series, um, please go ahead and share that with us in the questions box now so that we can take a look and make sure that we're um, you know, making a plan to, to address those topics um, in future programming. So I wanna give you a minute to be thinking about that before we wrap up. And um, our, my last question, um, to our panelists is, um, th you know, throughout this, um, is there a, has there been like a specific tool or resource that you really wish you had, but but don't either because it exists, but you're not able to get your hands on it or because nothing quite like it exists that you're aware of, whether it's a piece of information or a resource or a specific type of equipment, it could be anything, but is, is there anything that you're sort of like, uh, if only I had this or had access to this, um, would be would be curious to know. And also, again, for those of you listening, if there's something that jumps to mind when I ask that question, tell us what it is. Um, so use the questions box for that too. So, um, Chris, I'll ask you to to go first. If I could go back to January 2019 and put a wreck through to have anything to make my life easier, I want a pallet of PPE of various masks, gloves, gowns, hand sanitizer that is set ready to go that is only broken open in case of pandemics that every year or every other year we, we update with fresh items. But if I had to do anything over again, I would have certain things that we ran short of in a supply chain um, staged and set off to the side that is not used only in case of pandemics. Um, similar to what Merv, we do do some on-site generation, so we had some stuff we weren't too impacted on, but the the other items to to be able to pull out, you know, a couple cases of N95 masks um, and and have the angels sing above your shoulders with the, the campus is is kind of the goal. I think going forward from this is to have that set off to the side, ready to be used. That's a great one. Thanks, Chris. Um, Gene, how about you? I uh, can echo what Chris just said. That's uh, something we thought about doing is having a space in our warehouse that's just uh, for uh, a pandemic situation. We do the same for snow, the occasional snow that we get here. We, we, we have that ready to go each winter. Um, the other thing that would be helpful, would have been helpful for us here at the at campus at the to the university here, we didn't know where all the research was taking place and where people were on campus. We had to discover that. Uh, there, there was no one master list uh, to refer to so that we can um, dispatch our staff to those spaces. So that was a little confusing for us for a while. And also as we planned for the autumn quarter, we worked closely with the, the general assignment classrooms which there are about 200, 250 or so. And we really work to get those, any potential classes scheduled one hour in between the PPE in the classroom and all the physical distancing visual cues. Uh, we weren't able to really do that with our departmental classrooms, which there's a, you know, another 300 of those. So we were fragmented there. And so when autumn quarter started, uh, if a student, did attend a, a class and a general assignment, they saw all this, the PPE and the visual cues and signage. But if they attended a departmental classroom, uh, there may have been nothing uh, prepared in, in terms of COVID prevention. So just having a little more coordination, we're, do, we're just a big bureaucratic uh, university and, and consolidating uh, what we do would have been uh, a big value to us. 
Yeah, that's helpful, Jean. Um, we're just about out of time. Merv, do you have a quick answer to that question? I have a quick answer, yes. What what would have been great or what I would love to see is a national standard, a national um, certification, if you will, for custodians. Oh, and Green Seal's working on one of those. How about that? That's awesome. But here's the thing. There are some of my friends in, in the industry right now that as they have to close schools are being told by administrators, you know, it's your fault your custodians aren't cleaning well enough or they're getting sick at school because the building is sick. Really? With these kids running around without masks and you're telling me it's it's because of my, my building. You know, I think we really need something much higher up, some kind of a global uh, certification that says, hey, look, these custodians are certified to do what they're doing. And uh, people need to not give the custodian crews that are out there working so hard, doing what they're asked to do, during this pandemic a hard time because you know some people get sick because they went to a building that's it thanks merv that really kind of harkens back to gene's words about silver lining and and, and hoping that elevating the profession and um in terms of level of respect and visibility and, and that type of thing is, is something that comes out of this. And you definitely mentioned something that the Healthy Green Schools and Colleges program is working on that everyone's gonna be hearing more about soon, developing a standard for healthy, sustainable facilities management programs, something that um, folks, will, schools will be able to get a certification for. And uh, ultimately down, down the line, there'll be a certification for individuals as well. So stay tuned for more on that. And before we adjourn, um, just two quick things I wanna make sure that we cover. Um, first, I wanna thank the sponsors of the Healthy Green Schools and Colleges program, um, including and especially our platinum sponsors, Diversity, Georgia Pacific, and Gojo, who are the makers of Purell, um, for their continued support. The program work we do throughout the year is not possible without these sponsors. So thank you so much to them. Um, and thank you to um, our panelists, Merv, Chris, and and Jean and everyone listening for your time um, today. I want to point out that um, if you're looking for more guidance, information, and another opportunity to attend some virtual programming on the topics we've covered today and more, and another opportunity to hear from our esteemed steering committee members, you're going to want to learn about our programming at the virtual ISSA show next month. Um, this will feature more in-depth panels like the one you heard about today, um as well as a number of other topics too so it's november 16th to the 19th with at least one live virtual session per day and you can learn more and register at healthygreenschools.org issa so definitely check that out and make sure that you attend the healthy green schools track at issa um, a final reminder that we'll be sending out an email with a link to the recorded webinar um, and a link to our resource center so thank you all for joining us today um, and have a wonderful afternoon